Welcome to The Green Room, a new podcast series by Sustainable Buildings Canada designed to help the building industry stay informed about the latest trends and techniques for building more sustainable buildings. I'm Jeff Fredericks and I'm joined by Charles Marshall, an engineer, sustainable design professional and partner at Dialogue. His colleague, Sebastian Carrizo, senior part, uh, buildings performance consultant and Kara Sloat, a senior mechanical engineer and sustainable building design expert. We're thrilled to be hosting our second episode of the Green Room Podcast. Today's episode will focus on deep retrofits and the important role they play in meeting our climate goals while improving community well-being. Our goal with each episode is to help educate you on the latest techniques and highlight recent case studies. We'll talk about key industry news and happenings as well as trends and their implications. Finally, we'll answer your questions. So, Let's get on with the show. Okay, Charles, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. My name is Charles Marshall. I'm an engineer and partner with Dialog. We're an integrated design practice of planners, architects, engineers, and designers. And we focus on developing great design that improves environmental sustainability, community well-being, and in- increases equity in the built environment. Nice. Sebastian, same, <laughs> same question for you. Hi, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm a senior consultant with the building performance team at Dialog as well. So Charles and I work work together closely. Um, my focus is on energy performance and simulation, with the general vision of supporting design to be better. Great, Kara. Same question for you. Uh, although I'd also like to hear how you got involved with Sustainable Buildings Canada. Definitely. Uh, so my name is Kara Sloat. I'm a partner with Hammerschlag and Joffe. We're a mechanical and electrical engineering consultancy here in Toronto. Um, and I have been involved with Sustainable Buildings Canada since about 2014 when I attended a workshop they were running um, to plan a deep energy retrofit and had so much fun that I continued to attend their workshop for the <laughs> next <laughs> years. Nice. Um, Well, today's topic, of course, uh, is a bit of a teaser to what Charles' presentation at the uh, Green Building Festival is going to be about. Um, So why don't we do that? We'll we'll, we'll tease it out a little bit and you can tell us a little bit about it. Um, But first, let's start with uh, asking each of you, what are you most excited about uh, in uh, attending this and participating in this year's uh, Green Building Festival? Start with you, Charles. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, I mean, it, it always excited to attend the Green Building Festival. It's a great chance for community to get together. You know, a, a group of people who share all kinds of different backgrounds of knowledge and expertise, but share a passion for great green projects and improving the built environment and, and making a difference. So I, I think the the roster of, of presenters and sessions is always a great you know range of perspectives, international perspectives, local perspectives, and Looking forward to getting back together again, particularly after a few years of the being a little slow with the, the conference circuit and human contact. Really looking forward to getting the gang back together. Nice. Good. Anything to add, Sebastian? Um, it's good to be in person again and be able to mingle and get re-energized by, by just that, that passion that, that attendees bring to, to these events. It's also great to see actual case studies and, and really hearing about both success stories but challenges that they faced as we look to implement this this beyond great uh kara what about you what's uh what what excites you the most about getting getting back to the green building festival my favorite part about the green building festival is that it is a uh, conference designed for green professionals so instead of hearing the same topics over and over about how to implement green practices at a kind of a more basic level they really tend to branch out in their programming so i've learned things i never thought i would see um, i still um, am passionate about the um, 3d concrete printing robot i learned about okay. at the previous green building festival you can look that up online if you want a teaser but yeah their content is bar none some of the best uh, in the industry awesome well it's uh, worth of course of plugging when the event takes place uh, November 1st in Toronto uh, it's as we said in person but you can also participate virtually and for those that have not already please uh, get out there register uh, I know the spots are going quickly um, so moving moving along let's uh, let's talk about um, I guess, Charles, just put some context around your presentation. You know, it's estimated that there are more than 4 million commercial, institutional, and multi-residential buildings in Canada. 
Many of these, of course, are aging infrastructure. So the question is, you know, how important, uh, in your opinion, are retrofitting these buildings relative uh, to their impact on the community? Why don't we start with that question? Great question, Jeff. I mean, in short, it's of critical importance, right? And, and, and one of the things we're always trying to do at Dialogue is find out what are the big world problems that we can help solve? And then how do we think towards, you know, the right partnerships, the right solutions we can reach in the industry, the right technical solutions we can develop to help make a difference there. And I know you mentioned four million buildings that need to get to net zero by 2050 and need to get a deep reduction, you know, we're talking about 40, 50 percent, even much sooner than that, say 2030, 2035. So that's a huge daunting challenge. It's going to take mobilization throughout the whole industry to get there. The, the, the element of importance is critical, right? You look at all the global challenges around climate change, technical challenges, social challenges. And, and I mean, you can do the math, right? Four million buildings and getting 50% of them-ish to, to zero carbon in 15 years is, is a Herculean challenge. So it, it, it takes a lot of knowledge exchange. It takes a lot of lessons learned. It takes a lot of willingness to be innovative and inventive across the right axes. And a lot of discussion, right? This is not an engineering problem or an architecture problem or a developer problem. It's going to take solutions and, and discussion across the industry. Uh, that's a great point. And Kara, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the barriers as you see them in, in accelerating uh, some of these deep retrofit projects. It's a great question. One of the critical things for me is knowing that um, we don't need to make every one of these buildings a deep green retrofit to achieve our goals. I think decarbonization is critical and a simple electrification of your building's heating systems will get you there. So one barrier is that we are approaching, I think, the task as maybe more her Herculean than it needs to be. Um, I want to see us really focused on the key takeaway. There have been three or four studies that have come out in the last two years that have shown that that electrification is the one key uh, to your project. Mm -hmm. And I think that people don't know that. They feel like maybe replacing the windows and getting a heat pump are equally important. So if we can really focus in on getting um, our buildings onto the low carbon electrical network we already have in Ontario, then we'll be one step closer to a solution. Okay. Sebastian, I'd like to get your perspective on this. Uh, you know, Kara's, Kara mentioned that maybe um, the solution is not to focus on all or nothing, but maybe you know there's another way of, of approaching it where it's it's you know 80 percent uh, and knowing that the 20 percent may not get there. Why don't you elaborate a little yeah, bit? Yeah, I I think it goes back to to a matter of, of of scale and understanding that the buildings are embedded in a larger network of buildings and that they play a different role um, within the, the the community they're in. So rather than focusing on making every building net zero and making every hospital net zero, we might be better off focusing first on those bigger end users that will benefit more from, from those, those earlier um, capital investments and then eventually tackle the, 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 the other more challenging buildings. So it's, it's taking a step back and it's understanding who the big energy users are in your network, in your community, in your campus and tackling those first and then looking for that other 20%. And, and why don't we talk a little bit about um, your clients and, and when you're meeting them and trying to convince them to, to undertake some of these, uh, you know, in some cases, heavy capital uh, projects. Um, what are some of those conversations that you're having with them and, and, and how, how are they going in general? And Charles, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the conversation has changed a lot in the last five years, which is a good thing. Right, the, the dedication of various organizations to carbon as a key metric, and then willing to really talk about you know, new solutions, new objectives at the project level to help get there has advanced a great deal. So I'd say to, to contrast one thing, largely the deep green retrofit projects we're working on and designing right now or having construction or have completed are for early adopters, governmental in, in agencies or, or developers that are on the forward thinking side, or as Sebastian noted, have have identified those right assets in their portfolio that are the right candidates to do something new or they're the right time of their life cycle. But we do try to constantly be advocating, and that's true for new construction, it's true for, for retrofit, 
to, to find the right opportunities for clients to do more. Maybe that's a technical solution, like, hey, air source heat pump is not something we have looked at before, but let's get it on the, on the list of measures. Or maybe it's looking at new objectives. Often the business case for a deep clean retrofit is not coming from finding those tried and true solutions of eight or nine year paybacks and, and, and lighting and, and quick payback type stuff. It's, it's adopting a new lens and saying, if, we're going to own, if you are going to own this building in your portfolio for the next 50 years, what do you want to be owning? How do you avoid it becoming a stranded asset or something that's trading at a discount because it's, it's a high carbon uh, generator? And how do we reposition this property and really envision its true potential? So it's, it's a broadening of the conversation and, 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 and trying to make sure we're using those right metrics that prepare the project for the, the, the era to come in the next 30 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, as you say, the conversation's changed uh, quite a bit in the last few years. Um, one thing that's changed, of course, are all these commitments, right, that these, uh, these organizations, these real estate companies have, have made publicly. Um, to what degree, then, are those commitments, um, you know, I guess, inspiring uh, owners, operators to, to get at it now, do you find? Is it, is it, when you say the conversations are changing, explain to me a little bit about how uh, this, this is in fact good news for the work you guys do. Well, when, when you make public commitments, it's out there. And the conversation changes of, on whether we should be doing this to how are we going to do this. So in the matter that commitments start continuing and that we have full disclosure and frameworks that allow us to verify and validate them, um, it's going to put pressure on, uh, on new designs or, or retrofits to actually do what we need them to do. So it's, it's one angle of, of putting pressure on, on our design um, industry and forcing us to, to, to really tackle this, this deep energy retrofits. Yeah, and, and I want to talk also a little bit about the role uh, the investors and, and, and shareholders play in this uh, conversation because, you know, often we hear about, oh, the, you know, what's the ROI on this particular initiative? Um, to what degree do you guys think that once we get more acceptance that this work has to be done by the broader community, including the investors, that that will alleviate the pressure a little bit on these sort of unrealistic ROI targets, perhaps. Anyone want to tackle that one? What about you, Kara? So I think the big challenge is connecting the right investors with the right projects. Mm. Um, there are banks today with investors looking to create carbon savings and get low but reliable returns on investment. So it is in at the Toronto market extremely possible to get somebody to finance your geothermal field, pay for it, and you rent it back from them over the course of time. And we've, you know, in the last four years, seen that go from an oddity that was hard to sell to something that is a um, crowded market and extremely easy to arrange. We need to move beyond just geothermal and photovoltaics, which are the two places you can get that done today, into financing that whole deep green retrofit package, including the windows, including the, the lighting, getting the major return on investment connected up to that low but reliable return. Mm. So that, that's really where I see the, the next generation of, of projects coming in, is expanding that existing investors' scope enough that it lets us do more in each building. And probably in the metric outside of just simple payback and ROI and really focusing on, on understanding the risk that climate change brings to assets mm -hmm. and the potential financial implications of it. So um, when we start understanding the impacts of resiliency and how they make our, um, our assets more reliable, all of a sudden you have more benefits than your bottom line financial value. I think that's especially yeah. true about something like windows, which have this really long yeah. payback. Mm -hmm. But are the difference between a building overheating during the many heat waves we expect to see in the next 10 years and being something that you can actually air condition properly. That's a fascinating uh, way of, of, of looking at things, of course, because uh, in many cases it's about mitigating those risks, right? And so then now you're talking about insurance on some of these assets, right? Because mm -hmm. we're starting to get into what are the implications of insuring a, a building if it hasn't been properly uh, modified to accommodate changing conditions. 
So you're right, it's about broadening perhaps the way in which we look at, at this, uh, this topic. The theme in this year's uh, <laughs> Green Building Festival, of course, is positivity or positive. Um, it's very important, right, that we talk about some of the great things that are happening in this space. And uh, I thought, again, I'll, I'll start with you, Kara, to talk a little bit about some of the things that you've been noticing that are really things that excite you, that, that are positive, that we should be celebrating. I'm thrilled about the availability of more exciting heat pump products in the marketplace. Um, it's very technical, but there are now all-in-one retrofit units that you can drop into the ceiling of a building. It will do air conditioning and heating and uh, energy recovery, and it's all in a single box. Um, so that is an exciting kind of technology. There are heat pumps that go to minus 35, which means that we can use them without electric resistance backup, which expands greatly the number of buildings that can successfully implement the decarbonization. Um, so I want to see more uh, entries into those families. Uh, the ASHRAE committees on refrigeration and refrigerants have created a new class of refrigerants that's going to expand what we can do with low carbon um, and low GWP refrigerants. Again, super technical, but I'm very <laughs> excited about it um, because it's going to expand our ability to use international products in the Canadian market. Great. And, and, and Charles, why don't I ask you the same question? Just things that you've noticed uh, or observed that are, are happening that uh, excites you and, and keep you pumped uh, to get out of bed every day? Yeah, I, I'd say two, two things. Is One of them is uh, alignment. We talked about environmental social governance, ESG, and how investors are coming to the table and asking their property, you know, their property subsidiary or, 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 or partners and JV partners on a project saying, where's the carbon message? Where's the objective? Are we reaching our benchmarks? Is this going to improve our portfolio? Even better, is this a flagship project we can put front and center in our sustainability report? And, and you know, the sustainability movement has been doing our thing for a long time, but it's great to see, you know, and these are not the, the, the types of brands that we're always talking about, but companies like Microsoft and Amazon saying they're doing their thing. And, and when they make their commitments, the world listens and you can see the impacts through power purchase agreements and, and you know, a real scaling up uh, of action and, and, and a so on, you know, government policy, et cetera, and, and a lot of action you can see now arriving that, that started with the Paris Agreement in 2015, trickling down at the municipal and, 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 uh, and provincial levels and so on. And the other one is just a, a broadening understanding of co-benefits and community well-being and how climate action is community action and how a lot of these retrofit projects that represent large investments, right, you're talking about, you know, minimum project sizes of $25 million and recladding and public realm improvements and a repositioning of a property in the community are also generating outputs of climate justice and equity and in improving communities around them, right? Because that, that really is a great opportunity. And the, the climate change challenge is not just a scientific challenge, right? It's a social challenge on many dimensions. So it's great to see the broadening of the conversation about how we make these solutions equally spread across those important dimensions. And when you broaden the, the the conversations you brought in the stakeholders and mm -hmm. engagement with communities, with occupants, with operators, and really making this a truly integrated design, but not just from the design practice, but also from the community, from, from the occupants. It's, it's really exciting times to, to just be part of these projects that are starting to happen, and we're starting to see them, and we're starting to be able to point to projects and say, look, that is a deep energy retrofit that's Passive House certified. And when you start building that momentum and start pointing to projects like that, then you get clients excited, then you show that it can be done. So it's, it's just the excitement around, yeah. around the topic. Well, that's great. And you guys are all clearly <laughs> pumped about it. And I love that. And that's the, the kind of energy that's contagious too, right? Because I mean, I think that that's what helps inspire others to get involved. I want to pick up on a, on a point you just mentioned, Sebastian, uh, too, about occupants, because we were talking at one point about this idea of... Um, you know, broadening the stakeholders. Let's talk a little bit about the role occupants play in, in, in the solution. Because, you know, uh, again, you can design a building to do all the things that it's supposed to be doing, but the occupants actually play a critical role in how well that will ultimately perform. So maybe you could elaborate on that idea a little yeah. bit if you could. I mean, we, the fundamental use of a building is for occupancy and for comfort and to provide a place of shelter for people. And oftentimes, 
we take out people from the equation when we're designing a building and then bring the people in and expect them to operate the building as we would intend it or as, as, as we expected from, from a drawing. And I think when the more efficient our buildings get, the larger impact occupants have on the building. So high performance design needs to include high performing occupancy and, and a large conversation around that is feedback and providing occupants the information so they know the impact of their decisions, so they know how other people are doing and eventually change behavior. Right, and, and talking about change behavior, I mean, we do have some examples of, of how we've helped change behavior. Uh, we'll use the recycling one because perhaps it's the most obvious. Um, but, it, but that starts sort of at a young age and, and we, we integrate that into the education s system. Mm -hmm. To what degree do we have to start doing more modeling of the behavior that we want our occupants to, to display? Um, Kara, do you have any thoughts on, on that piece? It's a difficult question. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, one of the basic conversations we have in this climate especially is whether or not occupants understand the influence they have over energy use by opening and closing windows. Um, when it is colder outside than inside and you would like to feel colder, do you open a window or do you turn on your air conditioning system? Because currently we give occupants both options. Um, I don't know how to tackle this challenge, but it is a really exciting place. I know behavioral um, scientists and talking about broadening the community mm -hmm. are doing more work and we need to bring them into the fold of sustainability so that they can help engineers give people the right signals to take the right action for their buildings. Right. So let's play that example out about opening windows a little, a little further. I guess part of the debate is if you open the window, now your AC has to work that much harder and then you lose some of the benefits of it just keeping the window closed and letting it do its thing. Is that part of the, 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 the like explain to me uh, where that becomes a, a challenge in terms of convincing some, somebody to change a behavior? Yeah, so if it is um, a beautiful temperate day outside, but you have a south facing window and you're getting lots of solar gains and you're uncomfortably warm, the best thing that you can do for the environment and for your own comfort is to open a window. Right. Vice versa, when it's hot and muggy out, we should, as engineers, have a way to tell you that opening the window is going to make it worse, not better. Mm. Um, at the moment, we do a terrible job of telling occupants, A, that they have that control, and B, that sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad to open a window. Mm -hmm. um, and how do occupants understand when that is? It's mm -hmm. certainly not something that we've covered in school. Right. Um, even just, what does a ceiling fan do? The, right. A ceiling fan makes you more comfortable by moving air while simultaneously warming the room up because the motor is inefficient. <laughs> so you need to turn it on when you're in the room, but turn it off when you're not in the room. That will create comfort in a, in a space. And we're just, we're bad at <laughs> yeah, helping you, people understand these, like, these subtleties. Yeah. And sometimes it's move like if you're if you're uncomfortable move yeah if you're uncomfortable if you're hot take off your sweater right. like there's a lot of layers to yeah. behavioral and occupancy that i think all intertwine to ultimately lead to an energy performance or a higher energy but it's habits it's creating habits yeah. so i really i, I want to go back to that idea of, of schools because habits start as young kids yeah. and start as games yeah. mm -hmm. and recycling started as as a as a game in schools yeah. and then was brought into into households by kids yeah. and there's a really neat opportunity to develop those habits early on yeah. and have them embed themselves into into the household yeah. buildings are built to last for multiple generations and rather than i think we need to address mm -hmm. the current generation mm -hmm. of users but with a mind for the next one yeah it's a fascinating topic, isn't it? Because this idea of behavioral change, I mean, uh, many people just don't know what they don't know, of course. Um, going back to your fan example, I mean, the fan can go multiple directions, but people don't understand necessarily the benefits of switching up those directions. Simple things like that. So perhaps um, as we think about solving the building, we put perhaps equal effort and energy around uh, behaviors that the occupants ought to con contemplate. And that maybe is uh, an education thing, it's an awareness thing. Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of things that need to happen in concert with all the great work. That well, there, there's a bigger element of systemic change there too. Mm -hmm. If you speak to a mechanical engineer who practices in Germany, mm -hmm. 
They would think it's insane that we heat buildings to the temperatures that we do in the winter and we cool them to the temperatures we do in the summer and that office workers commonly don't just throw on a sweater or that dress codes aren't relaxed in the summer so you could wear short sleeves or even shorts pants in, a, in an office profession, right? Maybe the whole shakeup we've been through in the last two and a half years with work from home and, 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 and so on puts us at an inflection point where we can adopt some of that, but it, but it is a systemic change, you know. Mm -hmm. Some of our clients have, have labor agreements or have lease agreements that specify these temperatures in them. And it, it, there's a cultural change that has to happen there. There's an educational change that has to happen there. There's a change in the industry that has to happen there too. And you know, any skyscraper you can point to under construction in downtown Toronto, a mechanical engineer had to hit a performance spec and that performance spec is signed off by the company that, that, it, that invested in that building. Right, so and in worst case, um, there are still uh, performance specs where people are expecting an amount of cooling per square foot that's based mm. on a 1970s yeah. metric. Yep. And so we're installing more air conditioning than we need, spending the money where it's not even adding value yeah. because the lease agreements require it. But we're designing it for worst case conditions as well. So you have this combination of we're designing old standards, coldest conditions or warmest conditions, which are only a fraction of the year. Mm -hmm. And we're mm -hmm. missing the benefits of having high efficient performing buildings that operate 8,500 hours of mm -hmm. the year perfectly or in a great high performing. And then for those 200 hours rely on, on, on supplemental heating or cooling. So mm -hmm. there's so many angles to, yeah. to how we change and it does come back to changing habits from occupants, from designers as a practice, mm -hmm. from owners, from clients, from everyone. Well, and I like the point that Charles made too about looking at other parts of the world, right? Where, where these changes have in fact uh, taken taken hold. Um, you mentioned Germany and and how they they may sort of look at the standards that we have and and and, and shake their head. Uh, again, maybe we need to push some of those uh, things a little harder here. That other countries have in fact changed their behaviors. Certainly, we can too. Um, and I also like that idea that it is a shared, a collective uh, responsibility here, right? We all have to kind of uh, do our part. Um, okay, well, I, you know, I wanted to also pick up a little bit about um, uh, the industry um, is made up of, of some great thinkers and, and there's been some great projects done over the years. Um, if there was, in fact, a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for the deep retrofit industry. One there should be. Uh, uh, there should be, right? <laughs> um, who, are, who are either some of the players or projects that you guys think uh, ought to be featured and celebrated? Uh, and again, we can look around the world. Are there some things that you think, um, boy, that, that was a major breakthrough and either based on, on, on the, the individual or the team that brought it forward or the project itself, it deserves special recognition. Um, uh, let's see here. I, I like, <laughs> I'm not going to look at you. I, I always have opinions. Yeah, good. Any project that goes through a deep energy retrofit should be awarded and should mm -hmm. be recognized because of the, the challenges and the complexities of diving into a project like this. So we would have a big hall where we have all the projects in there. Um, one that I'm really excited about and comes to mind is, is, is the, the sustainability plan that the University of Toronto has mm -hmm. implemented across their campus. And I'll highlight three elements that are really exciting about it for me. One is that they've, they've set targets that are absolute carbon metrics. So they've said, our inventory 1990 carbon, we're gonna drop it by 80% by 2050. And what that does implicitly is, it forces them to look at existing buildings, but also growth. Mm -hmm. As the campus grows, all these buildings add carbon. Mm -hmm. So focusing on absolute metrics is, is a really neat way of, of targeting growth, existing buildings, but also being able to document and verify. We can see how the carbon emissions are, are, are happening on a year to year basis. What it also allows, A, is at a campus level. So all of a sudden this idea of which ones are the buildings that I need to focus first um, is, is something really neat. And also moving outside of the buildings. One of the first things they did is they acknowledged that all these buildings are tied to a central disc plant. Rather than spending my money optimizing each individual building first, I'm going to put the largest urban geo exchange field there is in Canada. So under King Circles uh, Square, 
they're building a geo exchange system that will feed all these buildings. <laughs> With district energy, you're mm -hmm. updating one element and every building benefits. So that, wow. those are things that really excite me. And it's not a, a specific project, but it showcases the scale of what we can do when we think about it um, at a broader perspective. Oh, that's a great example. Do you guys have any, uh, anything you'd like to add <laughs> on that level? I, I, yeah, I'll, go ahead, Charles. I'll, I'll, think of, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit smaller scale than, than Sebastian and talk about a specific project. It's a, it's a sentimental favorite, but I'll reach back and talk about the sustainable building renewal at 222 Jarvis Street which is a project I was a team member on when I was a young, bright-eyed engineer uh, a, a while ago. I'm still bright-eyed and optimistic, but I've got a little bit more gray hair than I did back then. But uh, th this is in a, in a previous slice prior to joining Dialog. Um, but, but while I was a team member with Intermodal Engineering and, and we teamed with uh, WZMH and Figure 3 and Heidi Ray and, and other team members. So if there's anyone from the Intermodal family listening, hello to, to the team members. <laughs> but um, emblematic of a lot of the deep green retrofit projects we're a part of now but but you know some a project that was initiated you know 10 12 years ago but you know a 1970s era office building brutalist architecture very iconic architecture you know divisive to some but but without a doubt makes a statement and and completely renewed by the ontario government you know uh, insulation, new heat recovery, new ventilation, new interiors, new glazing, really comprehensive building renewal. On the energy dimension, you know, substantial uh, energy and carbon savings. A and again, on that workplace renewal and community dimension, right, talking about Jarvis and Dundas, which is a part of the city that seems is continuously revitalizing, but, but, but certainly at that time was, was um, you know, it was welcome to add some stimulation to that neighborhood. And, I would say many years later, you can really see the, the growth and intensification that happens in that neighborhood. And, and I like to think that, that that initiative by Ontario government to initiate this big building, it's going to make a statement no matter what it's doing, but make it emblematic of energy and carbon performance, sustainability performance was uh, really something substantial. So yeah. that would be that would be my one that I would, uh, <laughs> put, I would put up there on the plaque for the Wall of Fame nice. and we'll have to have uh, Eric Clapton or something yeah. play along yeah. and induct it in. <laughs> there you go. That, I, I want to go, I, I guess, and just acknowledge the two most interesting um, deep energy retrofits I've been involved in because um, both of them were private owners. So the Ontario Association of Architecture, who have this really um, flagship architecturally interesting building that is also 1970s sure. and was also extremely energy and efficient um, was able to lever uh, to mobilize their membership to completely reimagine how that building was heated and cooled um, and more than uh, I think reduced the energy use by three quarters okay. um, and it, it really is putting their money where their mouths are as an organization. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just honor them for doing that because that, that is, um, you know, professionals having to pay for that mm -hmm. building themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the other project that comes to mind is 500 McNabb um, because the city housing Hamilton, uh, along with the city of Toronto's um, TCHC, have both been investing significantly in their high rise towers and in buildings that have been forgotten by mm -hmm. an entire generation of. Um, city managers and, and um, government employees. So being able to reinvest in those buildings and take them not just from less efficient to more efficient, but from buildings that were unpleasant to occupy and maybe mm -hmm. even um, mm -hmm. were neglected, <laughs> unsafe, uh, and turning them into um, really um, community hubs, mm -hmm. um, spaces that are healthy for their occupants, but also um, motivational for the people who live in them. I think it's really important and I want to honor the people who are doing that work. <laughs> there we go. Well, we've got three uh, worthy <laughs> uh, groups here to honor. I'll bring in uh, another part of the country because of course in Tease at the Festival we will be putting a spotlight on a project out west uh, at, the, at the festival and the energy sprung kind of panelized solution uh, that uh, will be talked about. Um, I guess Retrofit Canada uh, is involved in that and we'll hear a little bit more at the festival about the role uh, panels play in in solving and then certainly for public housing where you've got that uniformed uh, typography it is a very viable solution um, so great we um, 
uh, I guess just in terms of uh, last questions, we're wrapping up here. Um, I'd love to, each of you to sort of uh, answer this question. Why do you believe it is the most exciting time to be doing what you guys are doing uh, in, in, in terms of exciting time in history to be involved in the space that you're involved? Uh, Kara, why don't we start with you? We need to modify more buildings faster than anyone has ever done before in the history of the planet. <laughs> we need to do it in 15 years. <laughs> it's a big challenge. Right, right, okay. Um, and picking up on what Omar uh, Kara said, it's, it, as an industry, we've realized how big of a commitment this is and it's no longer competitors and it's no longer individual firms doing their own thing. It's a community and it's a collective and it's understanding that together we are going to do this in the most efficient way. So the community element of the industry as we tackle this enormous task has really bonded us together. And I think that to me fills me with, with excitement about the future. Great. How about you? What, a, what about Great. Well, I'll say I share Sebastian's enthusiasm about, you know, what I said was alignment and, and talking you know, about in, investor communities and business communities and, and governmental, but absolutely within the industry, you know, the emergence of zero emission building exchanges and the acknowledgement of this problem is too big to solve in the same channels that got us to this point and requires that greater collaboration. And, and I will say, you know, we don't have deep retrofit codes yet. You know, I, I wager this panel would agree we would like to get that soon. But on the new construction side, the way that we're seeing rapidly emerging energy codes and, and, and additional metrics for GHG or thermal performance and so on, like in, in the Toronto Green Standard, the BC Energy Step Code, is tremendously energizing. As sustainability professionals, we still like a good fight. We still like bringing <laughs> solutions to the table and saying, let's do this and we'll convince you how. But it's really refreshing for that whole other portion of the market to have meaningful regulation coming out that's, that's moving the needle. And, and uh, you know, if, if we can start to solve the new construction segment en masse, then we can really start focusing on the retrofit part of the market, which is a, re a really exciting proposition. And as Kara points out, terribly urgent. So yeah. it's, it's a really exciting challenge to take on. Great. Well, we'll end it there. This has been an amazing conversation. Thanks so much, guys, for, uh, for joining me today. Of course, uh, to get more of this type of conversation, we'll uh, ask people to make sure they're registered for the Green Building Festival taking place November 1st in Toronto. And we'll, of course, flash the URL where you can register. Uh, but looking forward to seeing everyone once again in person. And uh, again, thanks, guys, for uh, joining me today. It's awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff.